friends good morning and welcome to the set live lectures dear friends as you know that we started a series on financial management and today we are conducting yet another lecture in the same series in today's lecture in the broader topic of working capital management we will be taking up the topic of receivable management to discuss this topic we have with us our subject expert dr amarjeet kaur Dr Kaur is professor of accounting and she has authored several books and research papers on accounting she has also have uh, undertaken various administrative positions of dean associate dean in a leading business school in ncr of delhi without further ado i would like to welcome ma'am to our studios and request her to start the lecture welcome ma'am yeah thank you thank you very much uh, a very good morning to viewers and welcome on yet another lecture on uh, financial management as has just been introduced by amrit that uh, we are going to cover uh, work uh, in under working capital management receivable management so let's understand uh, at you know at the outset what receivables are and then thereafter we will be talking about receivable management okay so uh, i would like to clarify that in in certain literature you may find receivable management is also you know use as a synonymous for debt management which means debt management and receivable management are you know one and the same thing so what are receivables receivables are basically when we sell on credit and the person to whom we have sold has uh, yet to pay us he is going to pay us in future so that becomes our debtors for the company who sold it right so basically uh, we are going to talk about how do we manage that you know those debtors how do we manage those receivables which are the outcome of uh, your credit sales so primarily we are concerned with uh, the credit sales and then uh, all those aspects which are interlinked like the profits which which are expected to go up if the sales go up uh, like the cost cost related to receivable man management so we would be uh, basically targeting three uh, broader areas one is what receivable management is then the cost and the benefits associated with the receivable management and the third is uh, you know the profit the effect of profit by making a trade off between the cost and the profits all right so uh, receivable as i said is uh, is the something which is outcome of is a transaction basically is an outcome of uh, your credit sale uh, the moment we sell it to somebody on credit means i as a business is going to extend credit to the person so he is basically has got the ownership or he or she or the business to whom we have sold they have got the ownership of the product we sold so so the ownership has been transferred your stock has gone down you have delivered the stock right your sales have gone up and your books profits have gone up because your books as per the accounting we go by accrual accounting right so the moment we show sales the increase in sales means your books are going to show an increase in profits as well provided your cost of sales is less than the you know revenue of sales so assuming the revenue of sales is more than the cost of sales your your profit is going to go up the moment you show a increase an increase in the sales right so this is one aspect to look at the receivables now the moment somebody don't you know somebody doesn't pay us he or she promises to pay us in future means they become kind of our debtors in our books which comes under current assets it means my current assets have gone up and the category of the current assets which is going up because of credit sale is you know debtors otherwise have you sold on cash my cash would have gone so in in general uh, you know uh, either the cash would go up or the debtor would go up and i believe you understand and know that the both are current assets so because of the sales either on cash or on credit are 
our current assets go up. All right. Now the point is, uh, when our current assets are going up because of this, because of the sales, uh, so uh, is there any other aspect? We are able uh, to manage uh, our, you know, sales increase in sales because we decided to give some credit to someone. And the effect it means what was this? It means there are two aspects. One is either you are extending credit to the existing customer, or uh, you are giving, uh, you know, you are trying to expand the. Ex you know, new uh, you are trying to develop new customer base. So one you are expanding the existing customer base and the second is you are uh, developing all together a new customer base. What is the outcome? Under both the conditions the result is same. The result is that or the, or the you know target is that we are trying to increase our sales. Alright. So this is the first thing that why we would like to get into receivables, you know, why would like to sell on credit because we want to increase our profits by increasing our sales either to the existing customers or to, uh, to the new customers. This is a general, you know, rule in any business. This is how any business would actually like to function. They would like to sell, you know, to more and more because more sales means more profits. So, so this is not a very big point I'm making. This is important for the topic, but yes, we all understand that point. All right. So the point is when a business decides to extend, uh, you know, credit for the trade they are into. So we call it technically as trade credit means the buyer to whom you have sold is the buyer for you right so the buyer to whom we have sold he is enjoying credit which has been extended by you right else what would have been happening else the person who who doesn't have money to buy your product would have been buying it because they are also running the business so they may be you know acquiring funding from someone else so either they buy your product by arranging some short loan from some banker or some financer and pay you in that case you get the cash so your your sales would be on cash or otherwise the gentleman to whom you are selling the business to whom you are selling uh, they they do not have money to pay they don't get a uh, short loan from either the financer or the banker rather they request you to fund their purchases with your own money, right? You are not paying them money, of course. You are giving them the inventory, the stock, the product you are dealing in. So, you are basically financing their trade. So, that is why in the financial literature, we call this as trade finance. The finance which is on the supplies of the goods. So, so this is one important aspect to understand. So, so let's go further now into depth. The moment as a business I decided to sell on credit, it means I have already invited few costs. So there are a couple of costs which are associated for the say for the credit sales because of the receivables. You know because because I decided to sell on credit. So we will uh, talk about uh, those uh, those. Uh, cost in a, in a while but let's talk about ob receivable management and the objective of receivable management receivable management means which uh, you know managing receivables for a business means debt management managing debtors of a business ensuring they pay us on time ensuring we spend minimum cost on uh, on the collection from them or in case they are def at default, we spend minimum, right? Also, that we we try to establish a trade-off between the profit uh, we expect to get increase because of this uh, receivables, you know, the selling on credit, and the cost of the receivables management. So, a trade-off between the profits, increase in profits and increase in cost. 
so we have to ensure there is not much or not at least equivalent increase in cost as per the increase in uh, revenue sales revenue so we have to basically check on the proportion of increase in profit and the proportion of increase in cost due to receivable and i am not talking about other cost here i am talking about only those cost which are the outcome of the uh, you know selling on credit so that is the con the concerned area here so so i hope you are you are able to gather what receivable management or what debtor ma debt management is basically receivable management deals with the cost and the profits related with credit sales so managing managing uh, the both the aspects in a way that are ultimately our profit goes up more than the cost of the receivables managing receivables now the objective of receivable management is certainly to increase profit one so that and to reduce cost second so basically the definition itself the nature of the you know the nature of uh, the concept is very much uh, you know uh, objective oriented so objectives of receivable management becomes uh, number 1 increasing sales or sales revenue and number 2 you know uh, reducing your uh, expenses so as the slide was shown to you that we increase sales revenue through uh, by targeting retention of the sales and by in, you know in uh, you know uh, creating a new market for us so either way so so sales cost and profitability are the three important aspects of receivable management so moving forward now let's discuss about the categories of the costs which are related with receivable management there are four categories so let's have a look at the slide uh, those four categories are uh, collection cost capital cost delinquency cost and default cost so let's discuss them one by one now so the collection cost as we just uh, shown you uh, on the slide means the cost of collecting debts from the customers to whom we sell on credit collection cost would comprise what let's elaborate let's uh, go into detail now collection cost means the moment you sell on credit right you need to have someone you know based on uh, the size of the transactions you need to have people you may require only one person if your if your transaction size is not very big you may not, may require 100 people or 1000 people you know if your transactions uh, of the volumes on credit are very high so so it's very very important that we plan in a way that we do not overstaff or we do not understaff if we overstaff the collection team means my cost of managing my cost of collection goes up if i am understaff then there's a possibility there's a risk that there there may be a delay in payment there could be default in payment so then in that case my cost would be you know in the my real cost would be higher so the first thing under the collection uh, cost is that we have to be careful in staffing related to the collection uh, of the receivables or debts so debt collection so one cost is the personal cost staff cost okay so so after that we may require the infrastructure those people who are who are have, who have been hired to collect our debt they need office they need machines you know computer or laptop to work at they may need fax machine they may need uh, you know the internet connection so all that infrastructure in hard form a building a telephone a, you know a water dispenser a maybe a, a coffee machine they all are interconnected cost you know overhead cost so we have to give a look on all such uh, aspects we may think to uh, procure this service from some outside agency we may not like to hire the staff on our roles we may like to take the you know outsourcing facility in this regard 
so there are uh, many businesses which are into specially into debt collection they support other businesses so we have the choice either to uh, have our own staff so this is the call to be made uh, by the by the business in the beginning itself that we want to have our own staff and then if yes then how many people we want to hire would they be on our role full time or they would be a part time uh, then then we have to look at the cost of the uh, office the machinery the instruments they are going to use we have to look at the overhead cost as well so this all is collection cost other than that we may require and we certainly would require in fact uh, the cost of accounting for collection it's not that you're just selling and they're going to send you checks you know and you need not to keep a record you have to make a schedule of collection you have to make the aging schedule of the receivables and as we do for payables so this these are the receivables for you so you have to have someone who keeps the aging schedule which means what is the age of the credit extended to x person what is the due date did someone pay on the due date or not if it is overdue then by how many days how many months uh, so all that records are needed to be kept uh, uh, you know intact and for that we need to have people so so accountants who keeps the cost uh, accountants who keeps the cost of even the funding of such trade so this is the collection cost and in the collection cost we do also include the cost of basic you know reminders just a practice you know if there's a practice uh, to send a reminder uh, 15 days in advance a month in advance then the due date so of course someone need to write either a mail or or someone need to ensure a text message goes or someone need to make a phone call or may need to visit in person it all depends on where do you function what kind of business you are in what kind of geographical location you are in so you may not be using internet you know it all depends where if you are working in a very far away village you may not be work, using uh, internet facility you may not be writing email you may not be using even phone you may be visiting personally you may be sending your employees to go and get collection uh, collection done for you so it all depends on 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 the business where the business is operating but i'm just giving you all aspects related to the collection cost which is primarily you know the staffs uh, the the communication cost by either email or phone or in person and then of course the collection cost in in terms of uh, bank charges etc so you may uh, you know somebody has paid you check gets dishonored uh, you know even that cost would be your cost uh, if your bank charges you for dishonoring of the check so even that becomes a collection cost right so we have to cater to all such costs and we have to think in advance when we we decide as a policy to sell on credit so this is the first kind of cost known as a uh, collection cost moving forward the second cost is capital cost now as i just said in the introduction that when we are selling on credit means basically we are financing uh, others need the buyers need here in you no know, to be precise so someone who need to buy your product you are giving him the liberty to not to pay to you for another 30 days 45 days 60 days right and and whatever has gone into manufacturing or trading of that product i mean raw material overhead labor cost etc etc that's what constitute the cost of the product you are selling right so we call them as uh, element of cost so all element of cost which constitute uh, the component of cost so basically your prime cost or you know your your overhead co factory cost in total cost of the product is something you are fun, you have spent on it for manufacturing the product or if you are into trading on buying of the product right and thereafter you sold it to somebody it means uh, now that product doesn't remain with you as your inventory anymore once you sell it to someone 
but you give the liberty to the person not to pay you immediately. So it means this is not the cash sale. So what is happening here? You have given credit to someone. Otherwise, the person to whom you have sold, the business to whom, whom you have sold, they would have used either their own funds, their own fin finances or would have procured from somewhere else and have paid you. So if they would have procured it from outside, then what would have happened? They would have certainly paid for that finance, that fund they have procured from outside. So there would have been some financial cost for the business you are selling to. No, now you, what is happening? Just to promote your sale, either to the existing customer or to the new customer, you decided to give a credit facility. Right? So that, of course, there's, there's a target. You have in, uh, an, an, a clear agenda that you want to increase the profits for your business. Right? So what happens? You, you are actually funding their financial need. So this is what is known as trade credit. And the moment you are doing that, it means you are losing the opportunity to use those funds for some other objective, some other purpose. So the funds which you have tied up in extending the trade card to the buyer of your company for your product, basically you are, uh, you, are, you are bearing the cost of the funds. Otherwise, you would have certainly used those funds uh, for some other purpose, for expansion, for buying more stock for yourself, for, for manufacturing more products for your own company, right? So the point I'm trying to make is this, uh, that you have the cost on you for, for funding someone else's need. Of course, it benefits you as well, provided your capital cost and other costs do not exceed, you know, exceed uh, the benefit out of this credit sale. So this is known as capital cost, financial cost for, for selling on credit. Okay. Now the third is uh, delinquency cost. So delinquency cost is basically when uh, when someone whom you have sold on credit defaults to pay uh, on time. There was a schedule, right? There was a schedule uh, on which you were supposed to pay uh, pay by. Uh, so the, the the buyer did not follow the schedule. So when buyer did not follow the schedule means uh, the business has become as defaulter. Now you as a seller, you as a business have well defined uh, process to deal with such uh, situation should have certainly once you decided to sell on credit. So when we have to initiate that special process of collection there are certain costs associated with that and that cost is known as delinquency cost. Uh, it, it could be you know cost for simply sending reminder after reminder, uh, simply send uh, you know someone visiting the person who, who was supposed to pay you or uh, maybe you know asking some other business, some other business acquaintance or, or uh, associate to intervene so the cost spent on such business associates is also the cost uh, of uh, you know delinquency so delinquency cost is basically the cost when we are we are kind of enhancing our efforts to collect from the buyer so this is uh, no way i am saying that a default has happened it is simply the the due date has exceeded so due date has exceeded and now you have the you know choice to decide which method how to approach to the seller so that you are able to collect at the earliest possible date. Why? You, you understand I believe uh, from the uh, previous discussion because your funds are at risk. You have actually funded his purchases or no, someone else purchases. So you're, you have high risk in terms of uh, your own funds, in terms of your profitability and in term, it challenges the system of course. It challenges, talks about your collection process. 
your process of selecting someone to whom to extend credit and whom to not right so so there are a couple of points associated with this it's not such as a straight point that delinquency cost has happened uh, if there is a default in the payment means there was something wrong in your assessment of credit worthiness of someone maybe uh, it could be exception but yes that there is a question mark on on the process of your business in selecting people and the businesses to whom we should be extending a credit or not right so moving forward the last category of cost which we have is default cost so now the moment i said default cost i hope you would be able to differentiate between delinquency cost and default cost they are all the cost are associated i am not saying they they are in isolation each single cost i just talked so far they are associated so so is the default cost the fourth category of uh, the cost default cost means as uh, you you have pursued you know once the the payment is overdue the it is over schedule so you have tried your best uh, you know uh, so to recover it by sending reminders by visiting by sending emails by asking someone to intervene up to that point your cost was delinquency cost the moment you become sure that you are not going to recover your sales right credit sales it means the the buyer has become insolvent a kind of in your for in your box for your purpose right now what is there now what what all actions can i exercise may i exercise this is a question in front of you as a business so i may like to go and use the legal path i may send a legal notice to the business asking and demanding the uh, the revenue uh, you know which belongs to you your your sales revenue which they have not paid or recovery of your debt is one and the same thing right so you may uh, hire a lawyer you may approach some app, some court if it was an international transaction you may have to approach a particular institution or a body people may write to embassies people may write to you know uh, the international bodies w2 and all so uh, so whatever it all depends what is the extent of the business or what is the extent, no whom you were dealing with was this an inland transaction or was it uh, you know an overseas business transaction so in, so in all you would be spending on collecting right so uh, you would try and if you fails to collect all those legal spending is your default cost all right so these are the four categories which are associated with receivable management so i hope you you could understand the meaning of receivable management or debt management objectives three important aspects and the course of debt management thank you very much for watching us thank you a very good afternoon to you all and welcome back on a second module on uh, receivable management uh, we will uh, you know carry the discussion we were having in the first half uh, we will talk about in this half we will talk about 
uh, how does uh, you know we take care of different aspects related to receivable management and there are a couple of them and very very important basically if you have to frame a policy uh, for receivable management or for debt management what all aspects should we be considering as a business so this is something good if if any of the viewer intends to open up a business you know get want to venture into a new business then all the this uh, the, the the following discussion is going to be very very useful so stay with us for for another 25 28 minutes okay so before those aspects let's spend one minute have a look at the slide and uh, just try to you know comprehend how sales and and other other aspects are related with reference to receivable management so kindly have a look uh, at the slide uh, this slide clearly shows you the benefits of receivable management right it shows uh, that uh, what happens when sales volume increase or decrease so uh, the second uh, the second column here is showing increase and decrease whereas the first column is showing item right the sales volume if it is going i stands for increase in bracket it is d d for decrease so if my sales volume is increasing the effect on profit is the profit would also go up if my sales volume is decreasing my profit would go down this is what we understand right it's a well known fact now the average collection period which is related with the receivable management if my average collection period increases so what is going to happen uh, uh, what is going to be the effect on my profits my profits are going to go down by increase in receivable period my average collection period right so if my my receivables are having higher age longer age then my profits goes down so one should target to reduce the age of receivables that's the point you know this is important to have an idea about this before we talk about other aspects of receivable management the last thing was bad debts if there's a default so means my bad so that is my bad debts if my bad debts are increasing i right we sh we showed you in the slide so my profit certainly goes down and if my bad debts are decreasing my my profits certainly goes up so this slide is basically showing you the benefit of receivable management because the the real sense receivable management is a trade off between the cost associated with the receivable management and the benefit out of it the businesses who which are able to uh, you know foresee the cost related with the receivable management well uh, uh, you know well in time and accurately and are able to calculate the profits because of uh, or the benefits out of 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 credit sales they would be the best ones to actually practice receivable management so it's very very important aspect because you are funding someone's buy, purchase you are putting your product on sale you are you are putting your business on sales stake uh, uh, on risk so it's important that you take care of all these aspects so the important aspects which are related with receivable managements are uh, there on this slide which i am going to show you so have a look at the slide there are three important aspects as the slide is showing you one is credit policy uh, second is credit terms and the third is collection policies this is what we have to discuss for the remaining time with us so credit policy uh, means the framework so credit policy means uh, the having deciding about the framework of receivable management how would i deal with receivables how would i deal with my debts that's what i have to decide right so there are two aspects in in deciding the framework of receivable deciding the policy policy document as we all understand is something which guides us Uh, in future which helps us to practice what we want to do so it helps us to foresee the future and write down in black and white on a paper and share it with all the employees all the people working with us so that we all have 
on uh, we are all are on the same platform we have similar practices we do not uh, you know have uh, inconsistency in our practices which really challenges our goodwill so if we are able to keep up with this, uh, you know with our policy if there is a consistency uh, all our staff members our team speaks the same language it really gives a uh, weightage to the to the to the management it really gives great goodwill it brings goodwill to the business so having a policy document having a framework in place is very very important right and in that framework we need to uh, take care of two aspects one is uh, the credit standards and second is credit analysis now let's talk about these two uh, sub parts in detail so as i said under the credit policy uh, we have to write or decide in advance we do not write but otherwise it should be known to all us all people involved in credit man, uh, credit management so first thing is that uh, how are we going to be perceived by the buyers they take us as liberal uh, you know sell, seller or they take us as a strict seller when it comes to credit sales so which means our credit policy would be restrictive or liberal that is something we need to decide in advance okay so restrictive credit policy means uh, we uh, we are very very careful we do not extend credit to one and all we prefer to not to sell to many people unless we are sure about their credit worthiness so we are extremely careful we are not very flexible so the so the directions instructions to the sales team would be that be careful we do not intend to go to sell to everyone on credit right so this would be known as restrictive credit policy on the other hand when it is liberal liberal means uh, uh, the company is not very very uh, fearful in selling uh, to the people on credit uh, they are they, they they feel is fine we will be able to collect uh, they just follow few points few basics of course they would consider some something certainly they may not go into so much of detail on the credit worthiness they not they may not be so much serious about uh, the credit worthiness or the collection time even so uh, then that policy would be liberal so this becomes very very important to decide in advance before you start selling on credit and also to review in case you are already selling on credit you are an existing business so deciding in advance or reviewing the credit policy in between you know by changing scenario we have to review our policies so it becomes important which means uh, which means this is decided in advance and as a part of uh, you know internal communication known to all all right so this was one aspect of credit policy the second aspect of credit policy is credit analysis so credit analysis means how so deciding the process of analyzing credit worthiness of all future or prospective buyers on uh, who who intends to buy on credit or other way whom you intend to sell on credit right so so this is what is known as credit analysis so deciding the process as i said would be uh, covered under this uh, aspect now analysis could be carried in two ways one is <coughs> internal analysis and the second is external analysis internal analysis means you are using such sources like uh, you have given some uh, you have your own prescribed format where someone writes Uh, or fills the information uh, you know to whom you intend to sell your prospective buyer he uh, you know that business uh, fills the information which is desired by you what kind of information it could be you know the sales uh, uh, in the past 5 years <coughs> 10 years 
uh, average age of payables for that business because now this is not your, your receivables this you are talking about someone else payment period that's that's that becomes your receivable period right uh, receiving age so so the age of pay, payables for that business whom you intend to sell uh you may like to know whom else they have been uh, you know dealing with they have been buying from uh, do they enjoy credit facility from others uh, uh so all other players whom they are buying on credit are they good renowned businesses you you know their practices so th- if you are trying to gather such information through a document to a form this would be known as internal source internal uh, information right uh you may like this is this is quite common to use in fact you may like to analyze internally but by just you know uh, by approaching employees of the business so you have some inter- informer you uh, you ask your employee to reach to the employee of the business you intend to sell on credit so it is kind of insight uh, insider information right so that is another way of uh, getting internal uh, information so credit worthiness and analysis could be done by using any of or all of these uh, means and this would be known as internal analysis the second is external so in external what do we do what all sources do we have so in external you know the primary source could be uh, the financial statements of the business financial statements as we know uh, comprises profit and loss account income statement balance sheet cash flow statement etc so we can carry an in depth analysis of uh, published financial statements available on website available in printed form of the business and can make out you know how, how much is the you know c- cash available with the business how solvent business is what is the liquidity you know we can calculate <coughs> liquidity ratios of the business <coughs> sorry uh, which will uh, help us deciding uh, to see you know uh, how easily they would pay us because if a business has liquidity funds available only then they would pay you on time right so uh, we can uh, we can find out the liquidity solvency profitability you know is business doing well would they be earning enough because unless someone has profit uh, no profit earning capacity the profitability they they cannot pay you off they can pay you well in in time uh, only if uh, they are doing well or they are managing their business affairs well if they are good in their debt collection they would have good liquidity right so we can actually analyze financial statement in terms of turnover ratio in terms of liquidity ratio profitability ratio and 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 can find out and can decide uh, to extend lo- uh, you know credit sale or not to some party to some business so this is one source of uh financial uh, analysis ex- through external means which is uh, financial statements and a very important source the second could be you know referring to the banker you can ask your banker to inquire from the banker of the business you intend to sell on credit uh you know such practices you may see would be more often uh, practiced by companies which which sell uh, products of high volume of high uh, high price right uh, and especially you know if we are selling to overseas customers uh, so so we generally use this method we may like uh, to uh, you know inquire about the credit worthiness of the prospective buyer through our banker so this is the second means of external analysis the third could be you may like to hire when uh, when the deal is of very huge amount in such cases i have seen businesses involving credit agency there are credit rating agencies who actually are trained who are 
<coughs> specialized in uh, you know giving rating to the credit worthiness of the business so if you feel like if you think your 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 transaction is of such a high amount uh, you may like to involve a credit agency from the outside so this also becomes external source of, uh, of credit analysis right so i hope you could understand the first important aspect which was uh, credit policy in which we have discussed two subheads one was uh, credit standards and second was credit analysis so i hope you 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 could grab the discussion we had on in this respect let's move forward now and talk about the second aspect credit terms under credit terms there are three sub uh, aspects sub topics one is credit period second is uh, amount or percentage of cash discount and the third is a uh, cash discount period right so here are the three points uh, slide is shown to you so let's talk uh, one by one all the three aspect under this second major aspect which was credit terms now as a policy as a business uh, we need to decide about credit period uh, so should we be extending for 30 days 40 days 45 days 60 days 90 days you know this is what is to be decided and that is what is known as credit period how would we decide about that the so to answer the question that how we would decide about the credit period the length of the credit period i'm talking the length of the credit period would be decided based upon uh, an analysis of trade off between the profitability and the cost if i extend for 30 days my financial cost my collection cost everything is restricted on around that 30 days especially my my capital cost my financial cost is limited for those 30 days if i decide to go and give the credit for 45 days certainly my 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 capital cost turns out to be one and a half times more right it goes up by 50 percent it means moving from 30 days to 45 days i am going to give credit for additional 50 days 15 days only right which is 50% of the 30 days or the original uh, you know uh, concept here so what is happening my capital cost is going to go up so how can my question was how can we answer the question on deciding the length of collection period you know sorry uh, the the credit period to be given to the to the prospective buyer the answer would be to see where do we trade off answer would be where would my profit be higher if i go and give credit for 30 days my profit would be higher considering the cost of the capital because i have my own cost considering the collection cost default cost delinquency all kind of cost but the most important cost here would be the capital cost and the collection cost right so i would be deciding based on you know the trade off between the profitability and the cost so i would see if my you know the moment i give credit for 45 days certainly my sales would go up that is not disputed that is undisputed that my my sales would go up which means i expect my profit to also to go up relatively proportionately okay so if i'm expecting my profits to go up then my the next question would be how much cost would go up the moment i give extension for another 15 days i am also increasing my capital cost for sure my collection cost for sure right so now at this point we would get the real answer we would see we will make actually different permutation and combination my sales go up by 5% if i give uh, you know credit for 30 day uh, from 25 to 30 days my sales goes up by 8% if i give uh, credit for 30 days 
my sales goes up by 15% if I, if I am going to give credit for 45 days. So how much sales revenue? That is in percentage. Now after the percentage, now you will talk about the absolute value of the revenue and change in profit because of that subsequently, consequently rather, right? So what is the consequent increase, which is basically marginal increase I am talking. What is the marginal increase in my profit because of this increased credit sales, because of the decision of giving, uh, you know, credit to someone, to some, to some buyer. And then I would see the increase in my cost, for, especially for capital and collection. So, and thereafter, so all, so you will have couple of combinations in front of you. This is how we do. And then you see where at which combination you have the maximum profits. Because the ultimate target of any business is to maximize the shareholders wealth by increasing profit. Right? This is the objective of financial management. We discussed in, in, the, in, the, pre, in the previous uh, lectures on this. So, this is how we decide on the length of the credit period to be given to anyone. Alright. So, moving forward. Now, after this, the second would be what would be the amount and the percentage of cash discount. So, cash discount means under generally what do we do? We say, uh, I am giving you the credit for 30 days. But if you pay me in 10 days, I will give you 2% discount on the total sales value, on total bill value invoice. So, so we write it as 2 by 10 net 30. This is a technical word I am using if there are students who may not have heard of it before. But this is in reality, you will find it every on, on every invoice used in the business. So, it's, it reads like this, I am I'm restating, it reads like this, 2 by 10 net 30. So, let us understand these three aspects. 2 by 10 means 2% of discount in case the customer whom you have sold pays you within 10 days. So, which is known as 2 by 10. If it is the 3% discount of cash discount I am talking here, it would be known as 3 by 10. So, if you pay in three in, in within 10 days, that is maximum by 10 days, you are entitled to avail 3% of cash discount. So, it would be known as 2 by 10, 3 by 10 and 10 is not fixed by the way. It could be 2 by 15, 2 by 20, you anything. So, percentage of cash discount or the number of days up to which the cash discount is applicable is completely the policy matter. You would have decided in the policy itself. Right? So, we decide, here we decide how many days up to which the cash discount is applicable and how much would be the percentage of cash discount up to those days decided. Right? So, it would be known as 2 by 10, 3 by 10, you know, like that. And net 30, as I said, net 30 means uh, this credit in total is allowed for a maximum of 30 days. So, your payment becomes due on 30th day by maximum. After that, we would start delinquency follow up, right? Deliquen so, delinquency co cost would be there. Up to this point, up to 30 days, we have collection cost, we have capital cost, right? So, now you can correlate the discussion we had in the previous uh, module today itself, okay. So, the point is, this is the policy matter. We need to see how does it affect, but it is not just deciding like this. It is just not as simple as it seems to be 2 by 10, 30, no. It is interesting because it has cost. It has capital cost, it has collection cost, it has delinquency cost, it has default cost, everything. So again, how would we decide? The question comes in and the answer is that we should be referring to those combinations and permutations again. We would be making different permutations, combinations with different days of collect, like days of payments and the different percentage of 
collection you know cash discount so so cash discount would be given up to these many days and this much percentage and the total credit would be for these many days so cash discount period cash discount percentage and the third is the length of credit they all are decided as a policy matter and becomes an important aspect of receivable management hope you you could gather this second aspect as well now we will move to the third and the last aspect of receivable management and which is collection policies so as you saw on the slide there are two aspect related to collection policies uh, i am showing it um, by moving my cursor uh, we are here at the last point collection policies right and under this we have two things degree of collection efforts and type of collection efforts so collection uh, decision degree so let's discuss about the degree first so to what extent our efforts would be to collect the credit sales this is what we are discussing right as a business as a company to what extent my after uh, my efforts would go for the collection right so we have to discuss the type how would i deal with the collection and to what extent would uh, would be my efforts at so uh, extent means i i can simply decide as a policy we would be first sending uh, a e an email followed up with a personal phone call followed followed up with a personal visit followed up with a legal notice right generally this is how most of the businesses do these are the efforts so extent of efforts but there are businesses and very interesting this point i am going to make out there are businesses especially the private banks who use muscle power right i said muscle power they use collection guys collection boys people with strong body build they have been hired they have been used and especially in banking industry you know insurance industry i have seen in private sector in the past i have seen it i have seen people coming visiting to an house of someone who had a credit card didn't pay about uh, didn't pay the credit card demand and then we saw the muscle boy the muscle guys coming they call as muscle boy they coming uh, visiting their house and and you know taking along uh, the furniture of the vision of that gentleman right this is a real thing and we all know it happens so this this is so the point i am making out is this that we need to decide in advance that to what extent our collection efforts would go where would we stop we cannot think of continuing pursuing the collection for for years right so we have to see at the industry practices we have to see the practices prevailing in that geograph geographical location you are operating in we have to see the national policies in this regard we have to refer to sectoral policies in this regard so it's not easy you know it may sound very easy that we will see we will do just this take uh, you know we'll go for phone call only no it's not like that we have to refer to many rules and regulation before deciding the effort and the extent of the uh, collection the last is the type you know so which we have actually covered you know type means uh, extent is to where uh, to what extent you are going to go the length and the period and and the type is as i said soft type or very strict type so uh, if you are you going to have a very liberal policy all right we will send one reminder because they are our permanent customer we would send a reminder after a little gap so then it means you are little liberal you are little flexible but you are strict 30 days means 30 days 45 days means 45 days so you have to decide in advance how do you want to be perceived as as a seller as a debt management company right as a as a business so these are the aspects related to receivable management so one has to decide about each and every aspect but the decision rule would be that we would be taking the decision based on trade off between the increase in our profits and increase in cost where is the point where increase in profit is more than the increase in cost that is the point which where we are going to stop right so this is the this is going to be the bottom line for all the decisions uh, with respect to receivable management 
hope you were able to comprehend the topic well thank you very much for being with me for this one hour uh, dear friends due to paucity of time we have to stop a lecture here on that note we would like to thank dr kaur for coming to here thank you very and much and delivering this wonderful lecture and thank you dear friends for watching our lecture stay tuned and keep watching thank you thank you very much thank you viewers